Well, um, thank you. As I've been saying, as I've seen people walk in here, a number of you could give this talk, um, and more of you have seen parts of this talk. So I will try to jump over the things that are recycled. Um, I, I was informed by several dog lovers that elements of my previous version of this were completely unacceptable, so I've done major changes. Um, and try, will try to get out without uh, putting myself on very bad lists of groups of people who like certain sorts of things that I'm going to tell you you should stop doing. Um, so what, what Jim asked me to do, besides get myself in trouble twice, was... Uh, to try to put some context in what you're going to be hearing about increasingly over the next months uh, as we uh, grind forward to the June something or other, June 12th uh, opening of the so-called Rio Plus 20 Summit, uh, one of the most recent of a series of uh, global conferences, summit meetings, uh, that the United Nations have sponsored around the ideas of environment and development uh, over the years. These can be traced back probably as far as the UN start, but Stockholm in 72, um, uh, first conference to put environment clearly on the international table, uh, marked I think most graphically by Indira Gandhi at the time saying there were two great causes of environmental degradation. Uh, one was too much wealth and one was too much poverty and that we had to find a way of thinking about those issues of under and over consumption jointly with environment to move along. Um, things uh, trundled forward and as I'll sketch today have now, you know, are a, a bumptious set of activities under the sustainability banner happening at the global level uh, in which some real progress has been made, though not nearly as much as people need and would wish. Uh, even more excitingly and with more uh, variety and surprises at the regional level, uh, uh, st states, communities, and so on. Uh, and then the place that it gets uh, both um, so highly varied, I don't know how to talk about it except in just terms of my own experience, but it's clearly where the rubber meets the road. Uh, what is going on locally. That is how people are or are not changing their own habits of how they use each other and the environment. So what I'm going to try to do is clearly not cover but touch briefly on um, what's new and what's going on, uh, at least in the perspective I've got at each of those scales on the sustainability debate, how those have changed through time. Um, it'll be sort of, uh, you know, broad and wonky at the global level. At the local level, I'll just tell you what I'm doing. So um, you can leave now or go get extra potato chips or whatever. Uh, so as I say, sustainable development's been talked about a long time. We can go forever into who said it first and so on and so on. Um, the version that has, uh, you know, could well have been just, you know, another of these great new international phrases, um, the new international economic order or something that would have come and then disappeared again, uh, but that surprisingly didn't, was cast by the World Commission on Environment and Development, uh, led by uh, President Brundtland of Norway, a Harvard School of Public Health graduate, uh, back finishing up in 1997, 87. And, uh, uh, she and her commission, which had no scientists, no wonks, just people from the real world in it, um, concluded with the fairly obvious, but in at least international dialogue at the time, unprecedented observation that environment is where we live, development is what we do, the two are inseparable. Uh, and that humanity had the ability to make that development, what we do to improve our own lives, sustainable, something that our kids could benefit from rather than just us, uh, to assure that people all around the world in the present uh, met their current needs without undermining the ability of future generations to do the same. And people have ranted and raved about whether that's an adequate definition of sustainability or not. Um, the fact is that in practice, from the level of the UN, through corporations, through communities, essentially every country I work in around the world, you'll find a vision which I think has stuck around instead of disappearing like all these other magical phrases because it, it, it really addresses stuff that is at the core of what 
people and businesses and countries worry about. That is, how they can balance, how they can bring into alignment with one another. Uh, their aspirations for economic growth, increasing just their material well-being. Uh, their uh, inclinations for social development, being in communities and groups of people who they enjoy and find enriching. Uh, and doing that in ways that the environment is improved and supportive of that uh, rather than essentially the thing you're spending down until it bottoms out and nothing's left for us. Um, so those three pillars of sustainability, which I'll refer to all the way through this discussion, trying not to make it just an environment talk, is what the dialogue has been about. And you know, there's a lot of dialogue. Uh, this one was sent to me by my son, who obviously thinks I probably say the word sustainability a little too often. <laughs> and it predicts that by, what, 2109, uh, all words spoken in the world will simply be sustainability. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's probably not really a great thing, but it's a log scale, so we got time to go. Um, <laughs> Um, that said, others have accused sustainability of just being one of these waffly phrases and they mean whatever you want it to. I was at a Wharton school, uh, business school uh, meeting the other week in which some corporate people got up and just said, well look, we're defining what sustainability means. It's what we do on our bottom line and our reports. And many of us in the audience beg to differ. Um, uh, that's no more true than country X can call itself the democratic republic of whatever uh, and therefore be democratic. Um, the phrase just like justice, democracy, other things is mushy, is debatable, and yet has achieved a boundary of sets of meanings uh, that matter to people, that they load real aspirations, real notions of trade-offs into. Uh, and so finally, academic practice just in the last five or so years uh, has caught up with standard usage in the political and real people domain, uh, perhaps just in order to say, yeah, we actually can measure this and so on, and have ground through a bunch of stuff which defines, um, and there are many of these, but, but the one I like best defines sustainability just as the Brooklyn Commission did, just as people in Village X, Y, and Z do, of improving human well-being for sort of all people over the longish run and view that in terms of how we handle the basic assets we've got to deal with. Uh, certainly our capital assets, our buildings and our factories and our schools, um, our human assets, uh, our health, our education and so forth, but also our environmental assets. Um, the forests, the soils, the clean air that we've got to work with and in various ways combine with those other things in order to create well-being all under the impetus of the kinds of knowledge we've got about how things work, the kinds of institutions we use to do it. I'm not going to do any more on this except to say, if that's your preference, there's now a whole angle of work that, that codifies and measures and talks about the functional relationships um, of sustainability uh, practiced around the world. However you conceptualize it, anchored in well-being, but realizing well-being depends on how we invest in people, in economic production capacity and in the environment. Um, the last cent half century by almost any count has been overall on average a very good half century for this human well-being. Life expectancy is up to almost 70 years. Infant mortality has gone down by a factor of three. Access to safe drinking water has more than doubled. Uh, literacy rates are now pushing 85% or so around the world. Uh, GDP per capita, even with the recent hit it took, has on the long term been going up at 2.5% a year, which we should all wish our bank accounts were doing that. Um, more than 3 billion people over that period have been through lives that have given them better living standards at the end of them than they had at the beginning of them. Now, obviously, there are places of the world where this progress has not been anywhere near as good as the average. There are places that have actually slid backwards over recent decades. But the fact is that on average at the global scale, uh, well-being has been doing pretty well. And that is good news indeed. The bad news is that this, this remarkable, you know, heroic progress uh, in how people live on the planet uh, has come at the expense of the planet. Um, and I could fill up tables of numbers here, there, and yon. That's what I do for a living. 
but I'm just going to take through some of what that progress has cost in terms of the environmental resources that we need to be handing off to our children and uh, growing the next generation of well-being on. If you like words and numbers better than horrifying pictures, um, economic development without environmental protection. I always put this in front of people who tell me they're going to disband the Environmental Protection Agency. That's presumably because they like living in the world of all those previous pictures better than in the one we live in. Um, in any event, without environmental protection, it kills the people that development is supposed to benefit. More than 100 million years live, 100 million years of productive life lost every year on this planet today due to pollution that we know how to fix. Pretty straightforward, urban air pollution, biological pollution of waterways, indoor air pollution in the home. Um, it limits our ability to produce essential food. Um, the finding that uh, even before the recent price spikes, that brown clouds, these things that the space shuttle people saw from, from up in orbit, great brown clouds, sort of like you know, a continent scale smog haze to get spreading over South and Southeast Asia, essentially every summer now, a uh, combination of biomass burning, automobile emissions, uh, and lots of hot sunlight. Um, it turns out that the reason um, the Green Revolution has been flagging in that parts of the world, that rates of growth in yields of rice have been flattened over the last decade, is because we've shaded them out. We've literally put so much junk in the air that the rice can't get the light it needs in order to grow. So we've lost a decade worth of technology innovation in the seeds due to the fact that we've gummed up the air so much that it's now light that's limiting rather than fertilizers or water. Uh, and finally, it undermines economic growth itself. Um, nation efforts to uh, recalibrate computation of GNP to include the negative part of it when we burn up a forest instead of harvesting it sustainably, flush soils into the ocean, et cetera, et cetera, um, show that the median country around the world loses one and a half percentage points, not percent, percentage points off its real GNP growth rates, which are on the order of like three or four or five due to environmental degradation, with more than a quarter of the countries losing more than five points. And since most of those countries don't have five points to deal with, it means that literally each year they are worse off than they were the year before. And those are some countries near and dear to all of us who I won't single out in this audience. Um, uh, the point is real improvements in real well-being are not being sustained over the long run in a quarter of the world's countries today. And for some of the biggest big economic growth countries, China, ourselves, and so on, by current accounts, we may be just on the plus side, but we're not on the plus side by much. And we're certainly not on the plus side by the three or four or five percent per year increases in well-being of our citizens uh, that many of us have been blessed enough to grow up in. Um, what many um, even relatively calm scholars of this situation see us is with those patterns behind us uh, heading over the next decades for what's been called a perfect storm. Uh, the intersection of our needs for, of, of, in a world where we're going to have nine billion people on the planet in many of your lifetimes, uh, demands for water going up by 30%, food 50%, energy 50%, uh, the set of diseases we need to combat up by 50% as we continue to churn out uh, new communicable diseases. All of these things coming together in ways that efforts to try to fix one of them, say grow biofuels to do clean energy, end up having implications for uh, world food prices and availability and so on. They're all stuck together and the battle for sustainability is really very much about what we do about both uh, calming down this perfect storm a bit, taking some of the energy out from under it, but then also buffering ourselves in order to ride through it uh, by some clever combination of changes in our consumption patterns, better institutions, better technologies to let us get more good with less bad. So 
Um, Rio plus 20, the plus 20 signifies that 20 years ago we were holding another conference in Rio, the one that was set up by that same Brundtland report, clever lady, to be a required way of handling the recommendations that they put forward in their report. So what's different? Um, it's supposed to be a time for dialogue and sometimes I think the kind of dialogues we have on sustainability uh, are anchored on one side by a part of the world that is spending so much more on advertising to get you to buy more products than all the other budgets I'll talk about today um, and a bunch of woeful creatures madly trying to protect what's left of the environment by means fair or foul and the dialogue between them ain't much to brag about. That said, um, the fact that we now regularly hold international conferences that bring together all the countries of the world, groups from civil society, groups from business, groups from academia, and they actually do try to work through this conversation in something a little bit better uh, than suggested by this figure is probably, probably um, a, a good thing to have happening. Um, that said, the dialogue has changed. If I just go down the route of what were the big things on the table at Rio in 92, um, the first big international conference on sustainable development and what they are today. Um, in 92, we were, the big thing we were pushing for was global environmental treaties. This was the optimistic period of if we had a global UN, what would you use it for except to do treaties? stop atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, um, do this, that, and the other thing. We had just gotten the stratospheric ozone depletion issue uh, relatively under control in 1987, uh, which unfortunately was the high point rather than the beginning of our work with global environmental treaties. But we had on the table at Rio 92 a climate treaty, a biodiversity treaty, and a forest treaty. Fast forward 10 years, 20 years, we've understood that the ability of global treaties to make these environment problems go away has been extremely limited. There have been some modest successes with the highly threatening ozone depletion problem being very notable and welcome. But by and large, these treaties haven't worked. Climate is more the rule than the exception. And the focus has shifted partly because of those failures, but partly because of the maturing of the sustainable development debate to move from a relabeled environmental protection debate into what the Brundtland Commission tried to make it, which was a way of moving forward with improving human well-being, but in recognition of environmental constraints. So you look at the agenda items that are being teed up for June, it's about international agreements to promote jobs, to promote energy, clean energy, to promote food production that is sustainable, to protect our water supplies but use them productively. Um, finally, a serious look at urbanization phenomena and how our cities can be made more inhabitable and usable, uh, a look at our increasing vulnerability to natural disasters and so on. Um, not a revolutionary change, an evolutionary one, but one that puts human well-being now much more central to the sustainability debate than the sort of environmentally tinged version back in 1992. Um, governance issues. In 92, very much about these top-down global conventions. Um, the Agenda 21, which was a, a, essentially a global blueprint that was produced for how to get sustainable, um, was then tailored to each country and region, but it was a master plan concocted uh, in Rio and then sent out to the hustings for people to implement. Um, and uh, right at the margin, we're beginning to open up these conferences to civil society, but there wasn't much of it there. Fast forward to today, uh, the notion of polycentric governance, that is it's a phrase of Eleanor Ostrom, recently won the Nobel Prize for it, recognizing that the successes we've had in grappling with some of these global phenomenon invariably involve most of the action happening down pretty close to the ground in corporations, in countries, in regions, but that a certain amount of leveling the playing field, establishing rules and standards and so on is essential at layers above that. 
from the national up indeed to the global. And the trick is now finding in a way that is modestly aware of the limitations of action at the global arena to say just what is those tasks that can only be done globally that are then supportive and enabling of national, state, and local activities down below. Nobody has an answer to that, but we're beginning to pose that as the question rather than madly race off and see what we might write another global treaty about. Um, a focus on green growth, compatible here. Uh, green growth basically anchored in entrepreneurs, uh, in individuals, in corporations, and so on, but now constrained and guided within a view of generating social well-being and environmental protection out of it. So it's, it's inverted the notion of where the major source of action lies. Uh, and finally, this uh, bubbling of a little bit of civil society has blossomed in to a full preoccupation with public-private partnerships. Um, there are more businesses and NGOs by far uh, lined up to attend uh, Rio Plus 20 uh, than we could have named in the world back in, in 92. This is essentially an all-sectors conference uh, in which um, possibly just all that much more room for people yakking and doing nothing, but a bunch of people there who are actually going to go home and do something different in their community, in their corporation, uh, in their state, um, which is a real change from just saying, well, maybe a few people besides foreign ministry people uh, can be in the room. Uh, and finally, the evolution of knowledge needs. Uh, coming into the Rio 92 conference, we were just at the opening of what has been a true revolution in the earth sciences of our ability to understand the functionings of the planet as an integrated whole, coupling its climate, its chemistry, and its biology, and the role of humans in it. And we were so infatuated with that that human well-being was looked at as uh, something off on the edges. Humans were things that pushed the planet, uh, not something that you tried to optimize for. Um, and that was, as I say, great revolution in science. It's going to be one of the great wonders to look back on 30 years from now. The shift up now is towards the evolution of this field of sustainability science that a bunch of us have been involved in, which is fundamentally about solving that equation I threw at the beginning. How do we produce more well-being for more people over the long run within a world of a dynamic but depletable environment? Uh, and the evolution not of global monitoring systems so that some global monitor can tell us what's happening, but rather of decision support systems, of which I'll end the talk today with several of them, that help individual players, you and me, corporations, communities like the ones we live in, states, to compute for themselves what different actions might we take to advance this sustainability agenda? What works for us? What are the different ways we might achieve the same thing? Bringing to bear much of that science, but harnessing it for the use of individual actors, agents in the world who get things done. And that's been a fairly fundamental transformation.